we're going to be tackling quite a, a sizable topic this morning. And in case you didn't see our social media platforms this week, we are in the middle of a relationship series, which is something we do every year as Kingdom Hope. We believe relationships are important. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, for example, five of them are describing how we relate to God, and the other, the other half are describing how we relate to each other. And when Jesus summed up the law and the prophets, he, he did the same thing, 50%, was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The other 50% was love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we are in a relationship series, which is important to us, but, but uh, we wanted to interrupt that series this week to discuss Israel. Israel is at the world's attention and focus right now, and uh, we think it's important as a church to discuss this topic uh, for a couple of reasons, and, and the number one reason is, is I, I have been concerned at some of the things I've seen on Facebook, and I've felt for uh, the modern day believer because there are such contrasting opinions that you could read. Uh, some of them Christian, and even in the Christian world, there are contrasting opinions, and, and there are certainly contrasting political opinions. And, and so, how do we discern this season that we live in, and how do we decipher what truth we hold on to, and and, and what parts is misinformation and what parts is just political agendas. And the only way we can really source that in, in the modern age is to go back to God's Word. God's Word is truth, but not with a little t. It's a capital T. It is an eternal truth. It, it is not moved by circumstance or situation. It is not taken by surprise by geopolitical situations. And let me tell you this morning, there you may have a political opinion on what's unfolding uh, in the Middle East right now, but what we need to do as members of a monarchy who serve King Jesus is actually see what his opinion is on the matter and get in line with what he has already said. I'm reminded, to put an example to this, of Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Joshua is about to lead the people of Israel to attack Jericho, and he comes across a man, and it came to pass in verse 13, it says this, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us? Or for our adversaries. Now, let me tell you, though, some, some people are saying, well, I'm for Israel. And other people are saying, well, I'm for the Palestinians. But, but really, that, that can get convoluted really quickly. And history, uh, you're talking about thousands of years of history there. And, and you're talking about a lot of nuanced detail. What comes next is probably more important. Because Joshua, at this point, he doesn't know it. But he's actually speaking to Jesus. He's actually speaking to God. And, and the man, who is Jesus, he said to him, no. <laughs> no. And, and, and I feel like that's a part of the conversation. It's like, well, I, I believe, you know, this, or I believe that, or this is, what I, this is my political you know, agenda, or whatever. And Jesus is, is, what we need to make sure is understanding what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying, no. It's not which side you're on. What you need to actually ask, the better question is, I come as the a commander of the army of the Lord... I have now come. And so it's not about what side you're on. It's about whether or not we're standing with Jesus. It, that, that's actually the more accurate question that, that we need to be asking. And, and how do we decipher that? And I, and I don't mean to make this simplistic, and because it's not, but we do it. Our first port of call always as a believer in Jesus Christ has to be his eternal word. And so let's turn to the word this morning. And, and let me just give you a heads up. In case you're not familiar with my teaching style, um, at times it can be inspirational, at times it can just be informational. <laughs> and it's going to be a little bit more informational this morning. Uh, I want to give you good information so that when you are uh, in, uh, encountering strong opinions in whatever platform um, or, or environment that you're in, that you've got good information uh, to actually process it with. And, uh, and, and that's essentially where we're going to be heading this morning. I want you to know that actually uh, the Bible itself says a lot about Israel. It has a great deal to say about Israel. It's mentioned 2,000 times in the Old Testament and over 70 times in the New Testament. 
And I want you to understand that Israel uh, was chosen by God and he, he, he actually made this nation himself. The name itself, Israel, you notice it finishes in El. That's the name of God. That's why you get El Shaddai, El Elyon, all those El names. Well, Israel is a nation that God made himself. And likewise, this nation was given land. It is the only nation in the world that was made by God. And it was, it's the only nation in the world that has been given land by God. They're unique in that situation. Are they more important? Does God love them more? Are they more valuable? No, that doesn't necessarily equate. And I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is that Israel is unique in God's plan. They have his name. They were made by him, formed by him, and they've been given land by him. It is the only piece of real estate in the world that God has dictated this is who it belongs to. It would, it would then obviously be no surprise to you that human history would, would, would dictate then that it's the most fought over piece of property in all of history. Why? Because that's the piece of property that God wrote his name on. And that's the piece of property that he said, it belongs to my people. And so, as we see this this battle over this land, let's first of all recognize that that primarily and firstly and foremostly, it's a spiritual battle. Now, as believers, we naturally, in our worldview, understand that the invisible is more real than the visible. And that everything that manifests itself in the physical has first been originated in the spiritual. Well, likewise, these, these, these arguments and wars and bitterness that are manifesting in the physical are actually originating in the spiritual. And you could go all the way back literally to the book of Genesis and even right back to Genesis chapter 3 to really go back to the Genesis, no pun intended, of that, to the origin of that. Now, just like uh, the land has been given to Israel in that fashion, let me also say uh, that, that we love Israel and we stand with Israel as a church. However, let me also say we love Palestinians and God loves Palestinians. And, and there is an invitation to salvation to the Jew and the Gentile. There is an invitation to come to Messiah who is king of the Jews Jesus is the king of the Jews, but he is also the king of the world. And so the invitation is through the Jews to the world, to Israel, to the Palestinians, to the Arab world, to even the Americans and Spanish and Russians. Even Aussies are invited to the plans and the salvation of God. However... There, there, there is an a ultimate plan through Israel that God has brought salvation through. And, and so we need to be thankful to Israel. Israel are the ones who, who actually uh, brought the invitation. They are the ones who actually wrote the Bible. So the Bible was actually written by Jews. This Bible that you love, every single author was Jewish. Uh, Jesus is Jewish. I don't know if that's news to you. Sometimes that's actually news to Christians. Jesus is Jewish. Now, hear me, Jesus, I didn't say Jesus was Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. Make sure that's clear in your thing. He sits at the right hand of the Father as the king of the Jews right now from the line of David. That is still his nationality, and he is returning uh, to live, rule, and reign in Israel. Uh, let me also point out to you that Jer- Jerusalem also has unique properties in its name. Uh, in, in English... Uh, I would say there is a chair, but if I wanted to make that a plural, I would add an S, right? So I'd say there's a chair. If I want to talk about all the chairs, I'd say chairs with, with an S. In Hebrew, uh, you would add an M, not an S. You'd add an M. So when, when, when the Bible calls it Jerusalem, in Hebrew, it's Yerushalayim. So there's, there's actually two Jerusalems. There's an earthly Jerusalem, and there is a heavenly Jerusalem. And the heavenly Jerusalem is actually your future home. And where we live, our citizenship is in the heavenly Jerusalem, which, if you flick to the back of the book, you'll see actually descends out of heaven and actually rests on earth. 
So our Christian worldview is not that we float away into heaven, but that actually heaven invades earth, and that's our eternal place of, of enjoyment in, in, the, in the Lord's joy forever, is in the heavenly Jerusalem that rests on earth. Now, when we're asked to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that's exactly what we're asked to pray for, that there would be no separation between the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. That the peace, the wholeness, and the togetherness of Jerusalem would be that God's heavenly plan would come and be mandated, instilled, and, and, and enveloped on this earth. And so when we talk about the future plans of God for Israel and the future plans of God for the church, understands that we are all unified in the one man, Jesus Christ, and his plan, his rule, and his sovereignty over the whole earth, over all of time, and over all of creation. And so there is a unique plan for Israel. There is a unique plan for Jerusalem. And there is a unique plan for salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, let me also just be abundantly clear from the very beginning. Jerusalem does not... Uh, sorry, Jerusalem. Israel does not have a side door entry into salvation. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. The only way for the Jew to be saved is through their Messiah, Jesus Christ. It also turns out that's the way for us to be saved. The only way for the Gentile or the nations to be saved is through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So it doesn't matter how you were born, whether you were Jew or Gentile, uh, Greek or Scythian, you are all one when we come together in Christ Jesus because there is only one way to be saved. And that is through Jesus. It just so happens that that plan that God came up with was that the one way was through the Jewish king, Jesus Christ. And he is an eternal king. So let's go back and let's actually jump into and see where we actually establish all this understanding. Well, it, it starts essentially in Genesis chapter 12. Like I said, God actually made Israel uh, himself as a nation. He chose an individual called Abraham. And he lived in Iraq uh, we would call it Ur of the Chaldeans in the Bible, but today we call it Iraq. Abraham was living in Iraq, and he was a pagan. He, he worshipped pagan gods. He had no idea about Yahweh. But Yahweh uh, appeared to Abraham, and he said, You, leave Iraq. I'm going to take you over to Israel. I'm going to give you that land. I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, the reason why that's so significant is because Abraham already at this point was old, and his wife was old. And for him to have children was just an impossibility. And so it had to be a miracle that Abraham and Sarai were to have children that would then start a nation. And that's exactly what God did. Abraham left Iraq and he went over to the land of Canaan, which then became the promised land. Uh, and, and God made a mighty nation out of him. And he made a covenant with him. And we first read about this covenant in Genesis chapter 12. So let's have a look at that. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of this earth shall be blessed. You just read about yourself in God's covenant to Abraham. Now, what's important to understand about this covenant is this is a one-sided covenant. This was not a, a two-sided covenant. There was no responsibility on Abraham's side to see this covenant fulfilled. This was an eternal covenant made by God to Abraham with no responsibility on Abraham to see this covenant fulfilled. He then reiterates this covenant in Genesis 15. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you give me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and, he accounted it, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord 
who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. See how the promise and the covenant is not just descendants, it's the land. The people of Israel and the land of Israel are united. You cannot separate them. They're part of the same eternal covenant in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, we see this. Uh, every time you say the name Abraham, you actually affirm this covenant. Because Abraham, his original name, meant high father. But God changed his name to Abraham for two reasons. One, in the Hebrew, there's an added element of grace there, which I haven't got time to uh, go into, but it's in, it's in the letter He, um, which is uh, number five, and it ex- ex- expounds grace. But also, he changed his name from high father to father of a multitude. So God spoke destiny over Abraham. He said, I'm no, you're no longer called high father. You're called father of many nations or father of a multitude. And, and so every time you say the name Abraham... You yourself reaffirm the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was a specific land, dimensions that were reiterated in Genesis 15. Once again, then in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 10, specific uh, dimensions of that land are outlined as part of that covenant. And it's then reiterated to Isaac, his son, in Genesis 21 and in Genesis 26. And then reiterated once again to Jacob. Abraham's grandson in Genesis 28. This covenant was reaffirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed through the generations. This is why you see in the Old Testament, sometimes Israel are in the land, occupying the land. Sometimes they are not occupying the land. However, ownership is always, whether they're in the land or not, ownership is always given to, to Israel. Even when they're out of the land, ownership is spoken of in the Old Testament still to Israel and still to God. In Ezekiel 36, God specifically calls it my land. God says, it's my land, and I'm going to bring you back into the land that I gave you. It's my land, and I give it to you, I'm going to bring you back into it. And so there is a specific ownership there, but you see, and I'm going to fly through these verses, and the notes will be available on the app um, midweek. And, and you'll be able to go th- more slowly through these verses later on. I just want to show you the repetitive nature of God drawing his people back to the land. That is always part of God's plan for Israel to be in the land, the land of promise, the land that he gave them. Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart, okay? So in other words, God's saying here, the sun, the moon, the stars, if, as long as they exist from, me, from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease. So if the sun, the moon, and the stars fall out of the sky, that's when Israel loses its land. All right, because there sometimes is an opinion you'll come across that actually the land promise does not apply to Israel anymore, that they've lost it um, through disobedience, they've been disinherited from it, not according to the prophet Jeremiah. According to the prophet Jeremiah, God said, as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are hanging in the universe, that's Israel's land. Then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, verse 37, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So there is also another thought, sometimes in Christianity, that once again, because of Israel's disobedience, not only has the land been dispossessed from them, but also they themselves are, as a people, are also no longer God's chosen people. Well, once again, <clears throat> you, you have to come and headbutt the word of God if that's where you stand theologically. Because he's saying, if you can measure heaven, if you can get a tape measure out and actually show me what I've, what I've made, that's the day that I'll cast Israel off from being my people. So the land is eternal. Israel is the eternal people of God. And they have a unique plan. They don't have a side entry. That doesn't mean they've got their own way into salvation. It's still through the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, just like it is for us. However, they are God's chosen people. God's chosen people is not isolated to the church. 
we have been grafted into their chosenness. Bad grammar, good theology. (laughs) We've been grafted into their plan of salvation, that God used them not only to give to them, but also to, through them, be given an invitation to the world. Isaiah 43, 5 and 6. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, which is Jordan, and gather you from the west, which is Philistine and, and what we would call today Gaza. I will say to the north up there, where they were in Turkey and, and other areas in Europe, give them up. And to the south, which is obviously Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God is always beckoning his people Back to the land, Jeremiah 30. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I will give their fathers, and they shall possess it. Not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's going to possess the land? The descendants. Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they are scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from all the peoples and gather them from the countries. And we'll bring, notice there's plural there on the countries, because sometimes people will say, well, this is talking about the, the, uh, the, the, the returning of captivity from Babylon. No, that was one country. This is talking about coming back from all the countries. I will feed them on the mountains and the valleys and inhabited on the country. Ezekiel 36, by the way, um, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39 does happen in sequence. Ezekiel 36 and 37 have primarily already played out. 38 and 39 is on the horizon, which we'll talk about towards the end. But in Ezekiel 36, we see fulfillment of prophecy here because it says the desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. Before uh, 1948, Israel was a desert, a barren wasteland. It was filled with swamps, malaria, mosquitoes. Nobody wanted it. That's why there are a bunch of nomads and basically nationalist people that live there. Uh, in, uh, there were a, a large portion of Israelites that lived there already. In matter of fact, more than 50% of the citizens of Jerusalem before 1948 were already Israeli. However, uh, it, the rest of the land was actually just desolate. 60% of the Jews living in, uh, in Israel at that time lived in the Negev Desert because that's essentially where uh, they were allowed to live, where they could live. In 1947, the UN um, in Palestine, as it was called back then, which I'll talk about in a second, was divided into two. And, uh, and the size of Israel was infinitely small compared to what the Arabs owned. Matter of fact, uh, 187,500 acres, 187,500 acres of farming land was given to the Palestinians, and 4,250 acres were given to the Jewish people. So this is all to say this, uh, not to talk about the fairness of that, but to say Ezekiel 36 came true, because today as we speak, Israel is one of the major exporters of fruit and vegetables to Europe yet they were only given 4,000 acres of land to do it with. What did, what did they do? They went to the Negev Desert and made it bloom again. Yeah. As a fulfillment of prophecy here, not only of Isaiah, but Ezekiel 36, where the desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. After God made a, a land and a people promise to Abraham, he then went on and made a, a kingship promise to David, who was a descendant of Abraham. And once again, this was all part of the plan of salvation to bring salvation to the world. And in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, we see this promise to David. It says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father, and he shall be a son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and the blows of the son of men. But by mercy, but my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Jesus, because he is the king of the Jews, he's the king of the Jews forever. 
He is from the tribe of Judah. He is the king of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is the king of Israel. He is also the king of the world as well. However, don't, you, he's both. He is the king of the Jews and he's the king of the world. We can't actually separate those two feats. We see in Isaiah 11 verse 1, another prophecy in reference to the Davidic covenant and the fulfillment through Jesus. And it says that there shall come forth from a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Later on, I've skipped over a bunch in chapter 11, but you go down to verse 11 of chapter 11, it says this, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. Notice that, the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. There was one diaspora when they, Israel were ejected out of their land and were led into captivity in Babylon. And that Babylonian captivity lasted 70 years. We just did a study of the book of Zechariah, and so you will be familiar with that. This second time is talking about what happened, prophesied in Ezekiel 36 and 37, fulfilled in 1948, where for the second time, Jews from all over the world, and we just saw from the north, the east, the south, the west, were brought back into the land of Israel to recover the remnant of his people who were left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamas and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. You can tick that off. That has been fulfilled for some of us even in our lifetime. Some actually saw that prophecy fulfilled. Isaiah 41, just to reiterate this point one more time. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. God has not cast Israel away. They are still his chosen people. When Ezekiel 37 happens, if you're not familiar, let, let me just outline it for you. It's a, it's a vision that Ezekiel has of dry bones being brought back together and essentially a nation and an army of people are made from a dry, desolate, barren uh, land. Crazy vision. But in actual fact, God gives the interpretation of this vision himself in verse 11. He says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place in your own, in your own land. Whose land? It's Israel's land. Who gave it to them? God gave it to them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. And, and so once again, let me just reiterate this point. We support Israel, not because of politics, but because of prophecy. But because of the Word of God. As a servant of the King, there are times I just need to lay my opinion down and just say, yes, sir. Because the King has dictated it. He's already mandated it. He's already spoken. The King has spoken. He's heralded it. And, and so my opinion on the matter is, is, is really not pertinent. The king has spoken. It, it, it's, it's their land. Romans 11 verse 1. What about the New Testament? Shortly after Jesus came, God was done with the Jews and got rid of them. I mean, the Jews crucified them, him. Shortly after the Jews crucified him. They, now God's done with the Jews, Surely. Surely, like, the land's gone, the people are gone, the promises are gone. Well, first of all, the Jews didn't crucify Jesus. We did. You did. Our sin did. Our iniquity did. Your brokenness crucified him. The Lord of glory unclothed himself from his glory and, and, and wrapped himself up in your sin and your iniquity, and he placed himself on that cross, and he laid his life down willingly. Satan wasn't in charge of that plan. The Jews weren't in charge of that plan. Rome wasn't in charge of that plan. God was in charge of that plan, and Jesus did it. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter. He willingly laid down his life for it. However, that, unfortunately, I've got to, we've got to say and we've got to admit, in church history, that type of thinking that the Jews are responsible have actually led to a couple of really dark periods of our church history and theology. One, one essentially outlined as replacement theology, and, and, and that, can't, that at times has been titled that as a pejorative, but actually what the people who hold to that theology prefer the term replenishment theology. Uh, but essentially what, what is commonly known as replacement theology um, it has led to, unfortunately, not intentionally, but as a byproduct, has led to the genocide of the Jews. The relationship between the church and the state of Israel and the people of, of Israel has not always been, uh, been something that we should be proud of over the last 2,000 years. It's good now. We love Israel now. And, and we're properly placing her where she needs to be according to Scripture uh, but throughout history, it hasn't always been good. And in Romans 11, it seems like this topic was already starting to surface, where Paul has to address this himself. He, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Certainly not. Yet the theological debate rages on. I'm not quite sure why, but Paul has outlined it for us there with an exclamation mark. Certainly not. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And it goes down further in chapter 11. It says this in verse 25. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, talking about the relationship between the church and Israel, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The blindness of the Gentiles is in part, in part, part of the grace that we've received. That while God's attention is currently not on Israel... It is currently on us, an invitation to the whole world that whosoever may turn to Jesus will come and enter into the joy of his kingdom. However, the time of the Gentiles will come to an end, and at that point, and that's the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the dead, God's attention will turn back to the state of Israel. And one of the main purposes of the tribulation is to deal with Israel and to deal with the nations. The church is actually isn't present during the tribulation. What God's doing then is, once again, coming back to save His people, judge His people, and to judge the nations. But until then, unfortunately, there's a blindness on Israel, and in part, that blindness is so that as many Gentiles as possible can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. In verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Like I said, the tribulation is about dealing with Israel and their disobedience. And, and part of that is to save them and part of that is to actually also chasten them. And they will turn back to Jesus the Messiah. And we read about that in Zechariah. Verse 27, For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospels, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. Why? Because that eternal covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. All right, let, let's get real practical now. I've outlined quite a lot of scripture there, and apologies if that was too much and you've started to glaze over. I did that speedily because some people love a lot of evidence. Uh, and you can go back and look at that. But let's get a little bit more practical now. Uh, we know that in a futurist position where we believe that the revelation is actually a, a, a future prophecy that is about to happen, there, are, there has to be a state of Israel. This position was not so popular in 1947. But in 1948, it became a little bit more popular. But in 1947, when you read the Bible and said, oh, there's going to be a future state of Israel... Uh, theologians would be like, ha, 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 ha. no. <laughs> and then in 1948, a nation was made in a day, like Isaiah prophesied. And I can't, I can't communicate to you how much of a miracle that actually was. Like we kind of take that for granted. But Israel becoming a nation again was only God. It was only God. Only God's hand made that happen. There's absolutely no way that was possible without the hand of God on it. And so all of a sudden, the way in which 
you read scripture that actually the future fulfillment of Israel and the church and, and, and Jesus' plan to come liberal and reign on planet Earth became astoundingly more popular and evident after 1948, even more so after 1967, and increasingly so over the last few decades. Let me give you a couple of reasons why. Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant with Israel. Well, that's pretty hard to do if Israel isn't, an, isn't there, right? And, and that's prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Antichrist will invade Israel and desecrate the temple. Well, that's pretty hard to do if Israel is not a nation and if there's no temple. So, no, number three, that's prophesied in Daniel 11. And also, Jesus prophesied that himself in Matthew 24, by the way. Uh, the third one, God and his allies, uh, sorry, Gog and his allies will invade the nation of Israel when it is at peace. That's in Ezekiel 38, 39, which we're about to have a, a brief look at. All the nations of the world will invade Jerusalem, as prophesied by Zechariah 12. Ezekiel 38, by the way, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39 was prophesied 2,500 years ago. Israel pretty much wasn't a nation from those prophecies only until now. So it's only, for the last 2,500 years, it's been impossible for those four chapters to be fulfilled. It's really only in our lifetime that, those, that Ezekiel 36 to 39 can even be fulfilled. Why? Because Israel is a nation again. All the nations of the world will invade, Zechariah 12. The people of Israel will flee into the wilderness to escape the wrath of Satan in Revelation 12. So... There is a thought out there, and I've, heard, I've seen this several times, This and it's staggering that this exists, but I just want to address this real quickly. There's this, um, this statement that the Jews in Israel today aren't real Jews. That it's not, they're not really Israelis, they're not really, they've got nothing to do with Bible Jews, they've got nothing to do with Old Testament Jews. Israel today has nothing to do with Old Testament Israel, like they're just, they're just pretending. Yeah, because anti-Semitism and genocide is so fun, they're just pretending to be Jews. <laughs> like, I know Facebook is where reason goes to die, but that would have to be one of the more silly things I've read on Facebook, that, to, that the modern Jew is nothing to do with the biblical Jew. Uh, like, like, once again, if, it, how does, if that's the case, if the modern Jew is nothing to do with the biblical Jew... Somebody needs to tell Satan because he's, he's making a, a heck of a lot of effort to take him out. Somebody needs to tell the principalities over Jerusalem that have been warring over that nation for millennia that they're not real Jews and they should just move on to something else. <laughs> like like some, somebody needs to let Hamas know that they're not real Jews. Iran, they to need to let Iran know that they're not real Jews. Like, like come on, let's... Let, let, Let's wake up and smell the cognitive dissonance. Like, it's just... <laughs> of course, they're the real Jews. It was a miracle that God placed them there. They are God's chosen people. And they've got a biblical mandate. If they're not the real Jews, then, then let's get together and talk about the flat earth and the moon landing being filmed in Hollywood. It's preposterous thought. And anti-Semitism has got a new name. It's called anti-Zionism. They've rebranded it to make it more socially acceptable. But mark my words, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism dressed up. Yeah. Let's get on. I've got, to, I've got to skip a little bit. The keys are telling me to hurry up. Let's have a look at the spiritual. And why does this matter? Why, why are we having this conversation? Well, well let, me, let me tell you, first of all, because, because we want to, not, not because we want to form a political opinion, we just want to form a biblical opinion. We, we want to find out what, what God has already said about this. And, and, and we, we stand with God's plans. It's not that we don't love the Palestinians. It's not that we don't want peace in the Middle East. It's not that we, we, want, every, we, want, the, we want the nastiest, meanest terrorists to come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We should be praying that every murderous intent that is in their hearts gets replaced with the power of Holy Spirit and they get redeemed and they see the Savior and that their soul gets redeemed because as much as Satan hates Israel, he also hates all people and he is destroying Palestinians and Arabs through deceit, through, through blind trickery. And so we love the Palestinians. We want to pray for them. We want to pray for Israel. We want to pray for the peace of Israel 
the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem are met and, and caused one in Christ. But why, why is this spiritually important? Let me give you some quick brief points to take home. This is why we're talking about this. The whole word of God is true or none of it's true. You can't cherry pick what scriptures that align with your political ideology. Either the word of God is truth or it's, it's fable. There's no middle ground on this. Don't choose beige on this. There is no gray. It's truth, capital T. So we can't cherry pick. In Ezekiel 38, one of the prophecies is that no one stands with Israel. No one stands with Israel, which means at some point America, all the allies, the West are going to increasingly distance themselves from Israel. So it's important that the church does stand with Israel. It's important that we stand with Christ's brethren because no one else does at some point in history. Uh, let's, let's have a, a quick look at, at potentially why this matters to us because this is the times that we're living in. Let's, let's have a look at, um, at the overview of the 70 weeks. And this is a real overview. Like we could do a week-long teaching in this. But essentially, Daniel goes through a prophecy here where there are 70 weeks outlined of, of, of basically the rulers of the world and how it impacts the nation of Israel. And at the moment, we're in that uh, Daniel 9.26, the time between the 69th and the 70th week. We don't know how long that lasts. That's a pregnant pause. The, uh, the, the, the end of that uh, 69 weeks was when Jesus was crucified on Palm Sunday. We don't know when the 70th week starts, but we do know it starts with the signing of the peace covenant uh, with the Antichrist. So who knows how long we got? So it's important that we share the gospel with our neighbors because we don't know uh, how long this, this pregnant pause of prophecy is going to last. Um, however, we also know uh, that when the Jesus returns, we return with him, but that's when he will actually come back, and like I said before, he'll judge Israel. So it's important that we also share the gospel with Israel. It's important that we share the gospel with Israel. Joel C. Rosenberg, who some of you will probably be familiar with, you know, he says the worst type of anti-Semitism is to not share the gospel with the Jew. And as much as the gospel started at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world, now the job is to get it from the ends of the world, which is pretty much New Zealand and Australia, and get it back to Samaria, Judea, and to Jerusalem. That, that, that's now the mandate that is on us. Let's have a look at that Psalm 83 list. I just want to briefly mention that because some of you are familiar with Bible prophecy may be asking, is Psalm 83 where we're at in Bible prophecy right now? Uh, my, my short answer would be probably not because it's probably already been fulfilled and it's probably, there, there are two uh, opinions on this that I respect and two of my mentors in, this, in Bible prophecy have differing opinions on this. So I'll, I'll give you both because I'm, I'm also torn between the two. Essentially, there is a Psalm that outlines attack by the neighboring nations of Israel. And, um, and some would suggest uh, Mark Hitchcock would be one. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, he would say that actually it's a, it's a psalm of lament that is meant to depict all of Israel's history, that they, Israel is always at war with its neighbors. Uh, there's another guy called Bill Salas who would say, actually, this is a future war that's about to happen, that Israel will be at war with its surrounding neighbors before the Gog and Magog war. Um, I respect both those gentlemen, and I see both their viewpoints. I'm not sure which one um, I fully align with, yet they have much more expertise in that area than what I do. Um, Amir Safadi uh, has a, a differing opinion on this again. He actually says that Psalm 83 has been fulfilled from 1948 till today, that over the last few decades that's been fulfilled, that since 1948 the surrounding nations of Israel have always wanted to wipe it out, but God has been supernaturally defending it. And so is that what we're seeing play out in the news today? I'm not sure. Probably not, though, based on the evidence at hand. The next question would be, well, then, is it the Gog and Magog war? Once again, I, I would say it appears not to be, because there's a couple of unique things about the Gog and Magog war which are not taking place right now. First of all, um, it, it, it primarily involves Russia, Iran, and Turkey. If you want to get that list of nations up for, uh, this is the nations that are listed in the Gog and Magog war. You'll see that it's, like, once again, primarily Russia, uh, Central Asia, possibly Afghanistan, that kind of area. Uh, but essentially, it's Turkey, Iran, Sudan, um, which is um, also Ethiopia, 
biblical Ethiopia, but northern Sudan. And, and they come for spoil. And also in Ezekiel 38, 39, um, Israel has no allies. Well, at the moment, Israel does have allies. So I would say probably not the Gog and Magog war either. However, the chessboard is being maneuvered, gearing up to this. We already see that Russia and Iran are aligning. Turkey are aligning. Um, Russia and Iran are historically enemies, but they became allies only recently. And so we see the chessboard being maneuvered. And also we see that Iran has actually, you know, everybody knows Iran has uh, obviously sponsored this terrorist attack. Uh, they're sponsoring Hezbollah in the north. Uh, Russia and Iran are getting very close. The aligning of allies. President Erdogan said this uh, this week. He's the president of Turkey. He said, we're against the killing of civilians in Israel, but we also oppose the massacre of defenseless innocents in Gaza. Now, I just want to actually... I, I have a master's in communication, so which makes me an expert in uh, propaganda. And um, <laughs> so let me, just, let me just decipher this propaganda for you. Not only is this moral equivalence, it's one step further. Uh, what, he, what he's actually saying here is that the defense that Israel has, has undertaken is worse than, worse than what Hamas did to the innocent life in Israel. And, and so here, the president of Turkey, who's aligned with Iran, aligned with Russia, is saying that the killing of civilians in Israel, yeah, that's bad. But I tell you what, the massacre of the defenseless innocents in Gaza, like see this, the, the rich nature of that language geared to move your heart to make Israel the enemy. So Israel is actually fighting two wars at the moment. One, they're fighting a military war, but they're also increasingly fighting a propaganda war. And you'll increasingly see in the media and the political powers that be in the world today distance themselves and, and bring judgment on Israel for the defense of their nation. And you'll see Israel quickly become the bad guy. And, and we've, seen this, um, we've seen a slow burn on this in major universities around the world, in the West particularly. And, uh, and, and you'll see that increasing, which leads to Zechariah 12 verses 2 and 3. Let's have, let's have a look at that. Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. This is where we're headed. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of, tr of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen that in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces through all the nations of the earth that have gathered against it. Uh, unfortunately for Israel, the future is that all the nations of the world will gather against her. Uh, that's, a, that's a future prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And so that's why they're fighting two wars. One's political, the other one's propaganda. And uh, it's, it's a truth war, which is why, once again, I, I wanted just to bring the Word of God to you this morning and actually help you decipher. You make your mind. Don't take my word for it. You go search those scriptures yourself and see if they're in context, see if they're historically accurate, see if there's good exegesis uh, being employed there to actually understand that, no, we should be standing with Israel, that we love Palestinians, and that God is a covenant-keeping God. But here's the ultimate spiritual significance as to why this matters. If God can break His covenant with Israel, what's to stop Him doing that with us? He's got a covenant with us. Either God's a covenant-keeping God, or He's not. Now, the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are one-sided eternal covenants. The Mosaic covenant was a two-sided covenant. If you do this, you will get this. If you don't do this, you will get that. That's the Mosaic covenant. That's why it's been replaced and superseded with the new covenant of Jesus Christ. But the Abraham and Davidic covenant is a one-sided eternal covenant. And so if God's going to break the eternal covenant that he has with Israel, what's stopping him from breaking the eternal covenant that he made through Jesus Christ? The one-sided covenant that he made with Jesus as well. Well, let me paint it to you this way. There's a story in the Bible, and the musicians can come now, called the prodigal son. And we understand that, that prodigal story as the story of us, that we were the son, we were the person that rejected God and it's a story of salvation that we can come running back to God and that, and that doesn't matter where you've been or how bad or how much disobedience, that, that the Father will accept you with open arms. Well, if we're willing 
to live by that theology and accept that for our own story, why would we withhold that from Israel? Because let me tell you, exegetically, that story is about Israel before it's about you. Jesus told that story to Pharisees and a Jewish audience about Israel before he did it as an altar call in a Pentecostal sermon in Homeview in 2023. And don't get me wrong, it is about you. And anytime you want to turn to the Father, He'll be there with open arms. But why would we, in our system of theology, think that the Father would reject the Son? Now, I've just never, I, I, I just, that's not in God's nature. The nature of God is to be that father who is standing at the edge of the property looking for his son. And at the very first sign, it's the father running to the son, not the son running to the father.